beautiful bookstore. How may I help you? You want to know why we're called the Perfect and Beautiful Bookstore? Okay. <laughs> we sell used books that we feel have important stories to tell despite their condition. So even if a book perhaps has a broken spine or some of the pages are a little free, Maybe the page is yellowing, the cover isn't in the best condition. Regardless, we sell books that are still legible, that you can still read, but that may not be in the best condition. And you would think people would give us books that they don't really like, you know, books that don't have good stories to tell, <laughs> depending on your opinion. However, we found we actually get quite a bit of very, very good books. We purposely place what we deem the best books on the surface so that people are more able to get books that we think have beautiful stories to tell and that we want to share with you. Um, well, I think some people probably do that because so I know at least some people don't really like to reread books, so maybe if they read it once, they're like, eh. I'm done. I'm all said. <laughs> Just give it to someone else to rehome it. But we're grateful to those people. Because they have given us a beautiful array of wonderful books that we can share with you. Is there anything in particular that you're looking for that I can help you with? Okay. You're looking for a classic book. Okay. Do you mind if I give you a recommendation? No? Okay. One moment, please. Now, I'm a little biased. This is one of my favorite books. <laughs> it has such a beautiful story to tell, and it's told in such a beautiful way. So this book, is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. It's a very classic novel. It's about a woman, as you would expect, her name being Jane Eyre, who starts off as a very unfortunate soul. <laughs> she is an orphan at a very young age, and she has to live with her very uh, difficult aunt and her aunt's children. And as she grows up, she becomes a governess, which is just a fancy word for a teacher, essentially a tutor, to the ward of a very rich man. So essentially, a ward is a person who is taken in by another. And Mr. Roger takes in this French ward that Jane Eyre teaches. Mr. Rochester, as I said, is a very wealthy man. A poor protagonist, Miss Jane, is not a very wealthy woman but she ends up falling in love with Mr. Rochester. And as, since she's a governess, a governess typically lives in the home of her employer. In this case, Jane does live in Mr. Rochester's house, which is called Thornfield Hall. And while she's there, there are some strange happenings that occur. And eventually you get to find out why they occur and who they were caused by. And actually, I thought the ending was phenomenal. I honestly didn't guess it. So it kept me guessing throughout the whole book, which is really nice. Had a nice, very, very, very nice twist at the end. I also found with this book, or with kind of classics in, in general, typically they're, they're written in such a beautiful way that even if something is written that isn't very nice. <laughs> For instance, in this, in this book, since Jane's cousins aren't the kindest people in the world, uh, she writes an insulting description of one of her cousins, <laughs> but it was written in the most beautiful way. <laughs> so if you love beautiful language and a really interesting, intriguing story, I think Jane Eyre is a good 
Now, this book is in actually very, very good condition. I'll show you. So there's only a little bit of fraying right here in the corner. The spine is a little bit broken. But honestly, since it's a paperback, as to be expected, because if you read the book somewhat like this, it's going to break the spine inevitably. I don't recommend reading a book like this just to keep the spine in good condition. <laughs> but other than that, it's in very good condition. Pages are all legible, they're not written on or anything like that. Very good condition. This also, this edition in particular, does contain some in further information than just the story itself. So it has some insights from scholars, it has a little bit of information about Miss Charlotte Bronte's life. Of course, those are just optional reads if you actually wish to read those, or you can just read the story, it's up to you. Sometimes it's nice to get a little insight and hear about other people's opinions regarding a story. Sometimes it helps you things that you may have missed normally. Okay, I want to keep this one in mind. Would you like me to recommend another classic? This one in particular is not a novel. He has written novels, this particular author. However, the book I want to recommend to you is more of a collection of essays. Yes. Okay. One second. Let me have it. Once again, a little biased, D.H. Lawrence is one of my favorite authors. He writes very well. This is a collection of essays, and the term essays is used very loosely to describe the pieces that are in this book. So instead of having a novel where you have one long work based on one theme, this is a collection of loosely termed essays. So, for instance, D.H. Lawrence mentions some reviews about particular literature, about art. He mentions his opinions about particular topics, um, such as pornography and obscenity. D.H. Lawrence is known for uh, touching upon sexual topics. He talks about some of his travels to different places and his impressions of the people there, the instances and the things he encounters in each place. But I, would, I love the most about this, and the reason why I'm recommending this over, say, one of his novels, is that he writes in such a beautiful conversational tone. So what I mean by that is when you're reading this, it sounds like he's talking to a friend. So, for example, when he discusses a topic, he'll talk about a topic, and then all of a sudden he gets sidetracked. So talk about something else that's kind of random, and then he finds his way back to the original topic. So it's almost like he's thinking aloud to you, which honestly I appreciate that. I like that he's very frank and he just tells you what he thinks. Uh, what's beautiful about his opinions in general is that he isn't really bitter about his opinions. I know some people, we all do it, <laughs> some people when you get opinionated, about something, you have very strong opinions on something, you will get a little snippy. <laughs> Maybe not say it in the nicest way, it may not come out as nice as you hoped it would have. But I think he does a really good job balancing his emotions and the logical side of his arguments. This edition also is in incredibly good condition, this particular book. The spine, once again, is a little bit frayed, but once again, it's a paperback, so that's to be expected. The pages are in very, very good condition. The amazing thing about this particular edition is that this is the British edition, so the person who had brought this in 
had gotten this from England, which is kind of fancy. <laughs> Wanna keep that in line too? Okay. Did you want me to pick another one for you? Or did you want to look at anything else by yourself, possibly? Just look around, maybe ask me about particular titles that grab your attention. Anything like that? No? You want me to recommend different genres? Oh, I certainly can do that. Let me see. This is a sci-fi novel, so a science fiction novel. It is called The Host by Stephanie Mayer. Now, you may have heard of Stephanie Mayer before because she is the author of the Twilight series. We actually do have a full series. The person had brought it all in. However, I would recommend this book in particular out of all her books that we have in stock. The reason being that this story is very well told. It's very, very interesting. I typically myself don't tend to be drawn to science fiction novels. However, this story was, I was very, very emotionally invested in this story. So essentially it's about these alien creatures who come to earth. So essentially it's post-apocalyptic. These creatures take over human beings. They take over different creatures, but in this case, they're taking over human beings. When they do, they have this telltale ring, this shiny ring around their eyes, which shows that the host, the human being, has that alien creature inside them. And these alien creatures eventually take over the consciousness of the person, the host, that they have taken over. So they've actually been, those alien creatures have been doing this for a very long time on different planets. They just happened to stumble upon Earth and take over Earth. This story is about a woman named Melanie who refuses to be taken over. So. Typically, the aliens usually don't meet much resistance. They'll go inside a host, regardless of what creature it is. In this particular case, they're human beings. And they usually can just very easily take over that creature and control its mind and its body. However, Melanie has a lot to live for. She has a boyfriend and a younger brother that she cares very, very much about. And she's not willing to give them up to this alien. So it's very interesting because a lot of the dialogue that happens in the book is internal. So it's between Melanie and the alien who was tr who's trying to take her over. And the particular alien that takes tries to take Melanie over is an old soul. She's been on many different planets and many different types of creatures. And so at some points she does mention some of her other travels to other places. But like I said, I was very emotionally invested in this one. It also has a beautiful couple of romance stories in it too, if you're into that kind of thing. So it has a little bit of everything. In regards to the condition, the jacket itself isn't bad. It has a lot of scuffs. It's fraying. It's very slight. Sorry, excuse the glare. But the pages themselves are in very good condition. No staining or anything like that. If we take off the jacket itself to see the book. This is what it looks like. It's in very, very good condition. The jacket did its job pretty well. It 
also love, and the books themselves have a picture of the author. It's kind of irrelevant to the story, but I really enjoy seeing who created the story. And in this particular case, like I said, Stephanie Mayer. And this is her. I think this is a pretty good book to keep in mind. so it's during the civil rights movement and it's about a young girl named Lily Owens whose mother had passed away when she was very young that event proves to be very pivotal in Lily's life and sets a lot of events in motion so Lily lives with her father who she calls T. Ray he's not very kind to Lily unfortunately so Lily ends up running away with the woman who had taken care of her while she was growing up. And they find these three sisters who essentially hold the key to Lily learning more about her mother and also about herself. It's very, very beautifully written. It's a short story, however, despite its length, it's jam-packed with a lot of really good information. Every detail in this book is relevant, so there are no extraneous details. It's very thoughtfully put together. Once again with the condition, a little bit of fraying, a little flapping going on over here. A little bit of fraying again. The pages are in good condition. Some of them are a little bit wrinkled, but it's very minor. It's still very legible. So this is another option. Okay, let me see. I also think, although it's good to read books with a lot of depth, sometimes it's fun to just read books just for fun, right? So, there is one in particular I would recommend. This book is in sad condition, however, it's still legible like all of our books are. This one is called Last Seen Alive by Carlene Thompson. Now, this is a bit irrelevant, but I think it's fancy, so I wanted to point it out. This cover has little bubbles that are texturized. And they just feel really fancy. I just enjoyed that. <laughs> so I wanted to point it out. But this book is about a young girl named China who, when she was, I believe, around 16 years old, she was with her best friend Zoe. And although China was more of an old soul, kind of like in the host, um, she had a best friend named Zoe, like I said, but Zoe was a lot more uh, vibrant and willing to break the rules. And one day, Zoe and China were together. Zoe left to go meet up with a boy without the adults knowing, and she disappears. And China has the gift of premonitions, so she is psychic. When she's older, as an adult, she returns back to the place where Zoe had disappeared because her um, China's mother passed away and she had to come to take care of the funeral arrangements. So when she shows up, she starts hearing Zoe's voice and she starts trying to piece together the mystery of Zoe's disappearance that happened so long ago. This has a really good twist at the end. Arlene Thompson definitely keeps you guessing as to who done it. 
how what happened. But it's kind of fun to guess <laughs> and to see if you're right. I was wrong for a long time, and it was almost near the end when I finally got it, and I, I found out who, I figured it out <laughs> what happened somewhere. But she puts a lot of twists in it too. There's a lot more intricacy to the story than just figuring out who done it. There's a little bit of romance in the book as well, if you're, like I said, if you're into that. This book is in sad condition, as I mentioned. It's, someone took a bite out of that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately the corner is missing. It's definitely, it's been through a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> Spine is in pretty poor condition. However, like I said, it's legible. The pages are a little bit yellowed, but they are still in good condition. So the book itself is still legible. It's just the poor cover took a beating, that's all. Although, to be fair, for those who give us their books, who donate their books to us to sell, you can't be too harsh on the condition of the book because honestly, it's so easy to mess it up. So for example, if you're on the go and you're like, I want a nice book to entertain me, I'm gonna stick this in my purse or my backpack, anything like that. The second you do, if something's banging against it, if something snacks it, your book is done. <laughs> Maybe you're drinking while you're reading, it spills, it goes all over the book, and now your book is wavy and it dries a little funky. <laughs> so it happens to us all. <laughs> but I think the story is really good despite the external condition. may cause a little bit of resistance, but I urge you to keep an open mind because it's deeper than you think. So a book that's kind of in between on the depth scale, I guess that you could say, would be this one. This is a series, it's a trilogy, so there are three books. It's called Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Now we do have all three books if you're interested. So we have Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Darker, and Grey. Now you've probably heard of this trilogy before and know that they are romance novels. So these in particular talk about BDSM, which is essentially bondage, uh, dominant submissive relationships, uh, whips and chains kind of stuff. However, whether you're into that or not, I think, although you would think that these would be superficial and just about physical intimacy, I think she does a good job at least having snippets of really good wisdom and information in these books. And what I mean by that is, I feel like we as people tend to judge something harshly if we don't understand it. So maybe on the surface, you're think, you could think, you know, Oh, getting slapped would not, you know, do anything good for me. But she explains how, kind of how the, the dominant submissive dynamic works. Um, who really has the power in such a relationship. Uh, the BDSM is really a very interesting trust exercise. <laughs> and that physical intimacy can be very healing. And regardless of how... Uh, you choose to consent to it. So I think despite its... despite what you think would be superficial, its superficial nature actually is a bit deeper uh, than you would think, than on the surface. E.L. James, I believe, it, when she wrote these, I believe these are her first book. And you can see her progression as a writer from her first to her second her third go around, you can see that she's improving as a writer as she goes and the plot gets a little more involved as she goes, which I think is really nice to see. 
I also discovered this recently that I want to share with you. So the titles themselves are actually symbolic of the healing process. So for example, Fifty Shades of Grey. So when you are going through a tough time, everything's kind of confusing. It's gray, right? Fifty Shades Darker. So it got darker, it's getting worse. And then gray. Essentially, you're, you accept where you are and that's where true healing lies. I just thought that was really interesting. I didn't know that was a thing until I, I was looking at it on the shelves one day and it just hit me. I thought that's the healing process, so I had to share that. <laughs> now, in regards to the story itself, so this is about a woman named Anastasia Steele. She is a journalist and she ends up working for this very wealthy man named Christian Gray. And they fall in love, I guess you could say. Especially their physical attraction is something they can't deny, but then it does get deeper as they go. But Christian Gray essentially introduces Anastasia Steele to the idea of a dominant submissive relationship into the world of BDSM. So if I didn't scare you away with that, this isn't your jam. I can recommend something else. Okay. Sure. Now. I think... Since we went over a lot of fiction books, I can try recommending to you a non-fiction book. This book is called Night by Ellie Wiseau. He actually was a Holocaust survivor. So this book is talking about the difficulties that he endured during his time, um, during World War II, during the Holocaust. It's a very, very short book, but he does a great job. Is this him? He does a great job explaining what happens to him and his family. Now, I think one of the most potent parts of the book and the way he describes things is that he doesn't shy away from his own mistakes. So for example, a lot of Holocaust books, nonfiction books, I feel like most people when they read those, they instantly think, oh, the Nazis are the bad guys. <laughs> Only the Nazis did bad things. But we're all human beings and we all do bad things, unfortunately. So, I like that he does mention his deepest regrets during that time and moments he's not so very proud of. Of course, what he went through was very extreme. However, I still enjoy that he has the fortitude to say, yeah, I messed up too. <laughs> I don't know if you've read this in possibly in school, maybe in high school, but it's always good to have a refresher even if you did. It's in pretty good condition, once again, just small little creases, little fraying, but overall, it's very, it's in very good condition, especially the pages themselves. So that's nice. Now on this particular shelf we have quite a few good books. One of them is called Go Set a Watchman by Harper Lee. Now, like Knight, if you've read one of Harper Lee's novels, her first is called To Kill a Mockingbird. We do not have that one in stock, unfortunately. However, this is her second novel. Go Set a Watchman takes the first book, the characters in the first book, and projects them out quite a few years later. Regardless of whether you read the first book or not, or if you did read it and you forgot the details, that's irrelevant. You can still enjoy this particular novel. Now, this is about Jean Louise, who in the first book, her nickname was Scout, so she was known as Scout. In this one, she, Jean Louise 
Although that she was a child in To Kill a Mockingbird, she is no longer a child in this book. She is 26 years old, and she goes to visit her father, Atticus Finch. Jean Lee's idolized him. So in Ghost at a Watchman, it discusses a theme that I th have never seen in any other book. Naturally, I have not read every book in the world. I wish I could. But regardless, this theme I have never seen in anything else. She talks about the idea of having idols or idolizing people so much that you don't see them as human beings anymore. So when they display their flaws, um, it almost feels like a betrayal. <laughs> like they betrayed you somehow. And I particularly love the character of uh, Jean Louise's uncle. He just busted out so much wisdom <laughs> to Jean Louise about her idealization of her father and who she thought she, her father was versus how he really is and learning to accept him as he really is. So it's actually very, very, very beautiful as a book. The theme is so good that I highly recommend reading this. I also wanted to point out that Harper Lee, because she had written To Kill a Mockingbird, she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird quite a while ago. So I remember hearing when I was in school, oh, you could only write one novel if you wanted to. Harper Lee only had one thing to say to the world and she wrote it in one book and that's it. She didn't need any other books. And then she busted out with this book. And I love that she did that. Because if you have something to say, you have every right to say it. <laughs> and I love that she had something so powerful to say, and she just came out and said it. <laughs> I actually read this when I was 26 myself, and going through a similar situation as Miss Jean Louise. So I very much enjoyed reading. Condition-wise, you can see it's pretty good. A little bit of denting, some interesting shine on some bits, but otherwise, very good condition. The pages are also textured, if you can see that, which is interesting <laughs> and kind of fun. The pages are in very, very, very good condition. Somehow, the inside itself is a little bit, a little bit dirty, but still in good condition. So that is a whole set of watchmen. kind of mix it up. I would recommend this book of poetry by Rupert Kerr called Milk and Honey. Now this book talks about very upsetting topics. She, Miss Ruby, had been through an, uh, some unfortunate instances in her life. She has come out stronger in the end, and she shares her experiences in her poetry. Now, her poems are typically very, very short, but they are very, very deep. She also illustrated the book as well, so throughout she has different illustrations that are her own creation, and like I said, poems are so short. She, I believe I also read somewhere that all of her poems are written in lowercase letters for two reasons. One being the language for her culture would have lowercase letters and also when she, everything is lowercase, all the letters are treated equal. 
which is kind of nice that she gave some thought to that. This is definitely a heavier book just because of the content, but it's so well done and it's nice to have someone who understands the value of poetry and is willing to share her experiences in this particular format. For the condition, the issue mainly with this book is though it's in very good condition overall, the pages, the main issue are these little sticky bits. Now I don't know why stores typically put stickers on books, especially a soft cover like this one, because that can happen. <laughs> However they did it, and it's there. But, that's okay. The book itself is still well worth a read. Okay, so if you want to switch it up a little bit, I would definitely recommend her poetry. Now, kind of like with the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy, I urge you to keep an open mind with some of the other recommendations that I have for you. Now, just because you're an adult doesn't mean you can't enjoy children's literature. I honestly find that I enjoy children's literature a lot more now as an adult. They acted as a child a lot deeper than uh, you would think they'd be. So, or you could say I'm all. This book is called Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. Now, I typically don't enjoy stories that discuss animals, but this book made me cry. <laughs> and I've read it multiple times and cried multiple times. <laughs> it is about a young boy who really wants two coon hounds, so essentially he wants to hunt raccoons with them. So he saves up his money to buy his dogs, and he buys two dogs, one boy dog and one girl dog. And it's about their relationship. I mean, if you're not much of an outdoorsy kind of person, or you don't really, you're not really into hunting or anything like that, even the hunting parts are actually so well written that they're, they're pretty exciting, actually. <laughs> now, as you can expect, from me saying that I cried when I read this book. Naturally, something bad happens to the dogs. <laughs> but it's such a beautiful story. I do recommend this one. And this one has beautiful coloring on the cover. And it's in very good condition. Even the spine is in good condition for a paperback. And the pages are in good condition, though they have a little bit of scarring on the sides, I guess you could say. But still, very, very good condition. So I do recommend this one. Let's see. Now, if you're kind of done with heavy topics and uh, sick of crying, this book just may help. This book is called Once Upon a Marigold by Jean Ferris. It's, this book is pretty much jam-packed with silly humor, almost like you know, <laughs> slapper kind of humor. She, this book is essentially about this young boy named Christian who runs away from home and finds a troll. This is a fantasy book. And the troll ends up raising Christian. And Christian is very, very talented with creating inventions. So he creates an invention to, to help him see the castle across the way a little bit better because there is a young princess there named Marigold who he is interested in, so essentially he uses in his inventions to stalk her from afar. <laughs> and because of his stalking, he finds out 
that there is a, a, a terrible plot against Marigold and Marigold's father, the king. So he sets about trying to protect Marigold and her father. But it's it's kind of silly, but it's actually a very cute story and I would recommend it if you just want something a bit lighter to read. Now, this book has some fraying, the cover's not doing so great. It also, I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's a bit wavy, so this one might have had some type of water damage. It's a little bit crinkly some of the pages to a digger, unfortunately. But they're still legible. And they're folded. You can still read the words. The words are still protected despite the folds. So even though it's not in the best condition, it's still ready to go when you want to read it. There's no shame in enjoying picture books. This particular picture book is The Lion and the Mouse by Jerry Pinkney. Now, on the front, it shows the lion, and on the back, it shows the mouse. So this is what's known as a worthless picture book which means that the majority of the story is told through pictures, illustrations, as opposed to words. It doesn't mean that there are absolutely no words in the book. Um, typically, onomatopoeia would be in the book. So for example, something like squeak, zip, zap, boom, those kind of words, sound words, would be in the book. But for the most part, there are no words. This is an example, so. It says Gur, but otherwise it's an illustration, and the illustrations are very well done. But essentially the point of a wordless picture book is to give you the chance to essentially make up the story as you go, and you can interpret the story as you wish and make the words your own. So particularly for children, it gives them the chance to retell a story or to tell a story their way based on their interpretation of the illustrations and how the illustrations line up. What's beautiful about this being a wordless picture book when it's about the lion and the mouse, which is a very old Aesop's tale, is that typically stories like that would be told from generation to generation by word of mouth. And Jerry Pinkney, by making the Lion and the Mouse itself into a wordless picture book. He's essentially giving the modern reader the opportunity to tell orally a story that has been told orally from generation to generation, so it's actually pretty clever. <laughs> the condition of this book is absolutely stunning. It is very, very well kept. A little bit of fray on the jacket, but it's very, very minor. This is the inside cover. Lion and the Mouse. By Jerry Pinkley. The actual book itself is in very good condition. And the pages are in good condition as well. There's also a picture. Mr. Pinkney in the back. This is Mr. Pinkney. He romance treated the book. And it happened to get the Caldecott Medal, which is the highest honor in for children's illustrations. So this is always a good one.
this book is an older book. It is called A Chair for My Mother by Vera B. Williams. It also received the Caldecott Medal for illustration. Now, this book I think is very heartwarming. I always really liked it. I think it's a classic. So essentially this young girl, unfortunately her home gets set on fire and her family loses everything. So her mother works in a diner and she works very, very hard all day long. And she just wants to have a chair to rest so she can lay back when she comes home and just relax. <laughs> Which is not a bad thought. So this young girl and her family raise up the money to get the mother a chair. It's actually a very cute story. That's look at the money they raised. <laughs> it's very cute. Very heartwarming. Showing how you can bounce back from a tragedy, you know. The condition is pretty good. This page has a bit of a fold. Right here. However, overall the book itself is in pretty good condition. The pages are in good condition. And with the jacket off, the book is in very good condition. Even the edges are in very good condition. So I do recommend this one for sure. Right. Now I think I have two more recommendations for our picture books for you. One of which is called This Is Not My Hat by John Carson. Now this book also received the Caldecott Medal. However, this edition was before that determination was decided by the American Library Association, which is the board that decides which book earned that honor. So even though it doesn't show the medal here, it did win that award. Now this book it's interesting that it's a children's book, I gotta say, because it's about this little fish right here who took this hat, this little hat from a bigger fish, and he gets so big headed <laughs> for such a little fish and thinks, well, hey, this big fish is never gonna find me. No one's gonna know that I stole this hat from that big fish. I'm gonna get away with it. But one of the reasons why this won the Caldecott Medal is because the illustrations and the words are a bit in opposition. So, for example, this is the big fish whose hat has gone missing. And the words are, are essentially what the little fish is saying. So, for instance, on this two-page spread, he's saying that most likely the fish who was sleeping at the time isn't going to wake up anytime soon and notice that his hat is missing. But we see in the illustration, he's awake. <laughs> but the interesting part of this book is that it kind of leaves it open to interpretation what happens to this little fish. <laughs> so if you were going to read this to children, you might get some interesting responses as to what they think happened to the little fish. But in a sick way, it's kind of funny. <laughs> so it's definitely an interesting read. The, the disparity between the pictures and the words really does make it for the condition. 
the jacket is a little bit bent in certain places. The pages, though, are in very good condition. And the book itself is in very, very good condition. Even the edges are in very good condition. today in regards to children's books is called The Dark. It's by Lemony Snicket who wrote a series of unfortunate events. Um, this is also illustrated by John Classen, so the author and illustrator of this is not my head. This story is very cute. It is about a young boy named Laszlo who's afraid of the dark. One day his nightlight goes out, his light goes out and dark is personified and speaks to Laszlo and tells him essentially where to find the light. It's very, very cute. I highly recommend it, especially if you're a child or an adult who is afraid of the dark <laughs> and you need a little comfort. So, condition wise, a little bit of fray, a little bit of staining here. Pages are in good condition though. The illustrations are in good condition. The book itself is in pretty good condition. It has a little bit, I don't know if you can see, it has a little bit of scratching on it. But other than that, it's in very good condition. So that is. Maybe the ones we mentioned, or any particular ones, did they catch your eye? Did any of the stories sound interesting to you? You want to think about it? That's completely fine. I know I spend a lot of your time, but I think it's important to hear about the writer's style, to hear about the themes touched upon in the books, and to hear a little bit more from someone who actually did read the book just because sometimes it's hard to tell what a book is about just because just from the cover or even from the blurb on the back of the book. Do you have any questions for me or do you want me to grab any of the books for you? No? Oh, that's good. I know, it's a lot to take in. <laughs> we went over a lot. So, I would recommend that you take your time and look over the books. If you need any help, you can let me know for sure. What is it? Oh. <laughs> of course. Oh. Okay. I want to know about my name tag. <laughs> we have very interesting name tags. So, of course, we have the name of our store, the Broken and Beautiful Bookstore, which references our very beautiful stories that may not be in the best condition. Now it says that we are dedicated to rehoming poorly treated treasures since November 2020. Now associates of the store, such as myself, are known as Defenders of Broken Books. My name is Cassandra, and because the store's logo is right up here, we were allowed to have our own logos, which this one is mine, and because we work with books, we were allowed to have an author alias. So my alias is H. Persephone ASMR. Oh, why 
why did I pick this logo? Oh, I can explain. So the H in H Persephone stands for Hades. The reason it's Hades is that I love the story of the Greek god Hades and the Greek goddess Persephone. Now, this logo, this symbol, is on this hand. This symbol is the symbol of Pluto. Pluto is the Roman version of the Greek name Hades. Now, typically in the center between these two times, there would be a circle. However, I put small pomegranate seeds in the shape of a circle instead. The reason being that with the story of Hades and Persephone, Hades had seen Persephone while she was with her mother one day, and he thought she was very beautiful, so he took his chariot and he swept her away, he stole her, and put her into the underworld. And when he brought her to the underworld, he gave her a pomegranate, because if you eat the seeds of the pomegranate while you're down in the underworld, you're essentially trapped in the underworld, you can't leave essentially, so, or at least not forever. So, when Persephone's mother found that she was gone and that she was, she had eaten the pomegranate seeds and essentially sealed her own fate, uh, Demeter, who was Persephone's mother and who's the Greek goddess of the harvest, was so distraught that she essentially caused a perpetual winter. So everybody, all the humans, were dying from want because they weren't able to grow food anymore to survive. So the main god Zeus told Hades, you have to bring Persephone back at least for part of the year to be with her mother so that Demeter can stop that perpetual winter from happening so that the gods can have their humans worship them again <laughs> because the humans are alive to do that. So Hades agrees. So Persephone is allowed to be with her mother for certain particular parts of the year. What is nice is that this story essentially explains why there are the four seasons. So when Persephone is going to be reunited with her mother, winter ends and spring comes in. Her mother starts preparing everything to look beautiful for her daughter's return. When Persephone returns, it is summertime, everything is lush and wonderful. When it's fall time, it's more when Demeter is upset that Persephone is going to have to go back to Hades in the underworld. And then the winter, Persephone is completely with Hades in the underworld uh, to rule the underworld with him as his queen. What's interesting about this story is it really personifies life itself. And it's interesting how Hades, essentially the god of death, the god of the underworld, sweeps away life, Persephone. So I have that story is <laughs> close to my heart. So I chose that as my name and my logo. Now, back to the books. So I will leave you alone to, t to look at all of these books. If you have any questions, you have any concerns, if you need further information, anything like that, please do feel free to let me know. I am around. But if I don't see you <laughs> by the time you leave, thank you so much for